Good morning. Welcome back to the Making the Most series from Maryland Snap Ed. I'm Krista Carlson. Um, I'm your host for this series. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, if you're a repeat visitor, you'll know that this is our series of um, strategies for making the most of the food resources that are available to you. So we spent a lot of time talking about school meals, making sure folks know how to find information about getting free school meals. We've talked about uh, food pantries, how to uh, access ones in your community, as well as great ideas for things to do with the food that you receive from food pantries. Um, and now we're talking about gardens, which is a great way to add to your family's food budget. And also we love it, it's SnapEd, because it gets kids interested in healthy foods, gets them a part of it, um, and creates curiosity about healthy foods. And it's a lot of fun. Um, so we are actually joined today by one of our repeat chefs from SnapEd, um, Jessica Conjor. Uh, Jessica has shared in the past information about Charles County School Meals. Um, so we're just going to repeat what we always say, which is that the best information about school meals is going to be from your local school district. So check frequently, check before you go, make sure there haven't been any changes to the sites or the hours, especially as schools transition back to hybrid and in-person learning. Um, but make sure that you are um, staying up to date on that, on, on um, where to pick up school meals, and know that if your child is attending school in the building, they get a free school meal there. There's no income eligibility for the rest of the year. So take advantage of that as well. You can also always check at mdsummermeals.org. Um, so we are gonna highlight, uh, Jessica has a few highlights from Charles County around other food access sites. And sorry, I should say my usual introduction before we get going. Um, if you are joining us, please introduce yourself in the comments with your uh, county and uh, if you're from outside of Maryland, your city and state. Um, and comments, questions are always welcome and we try to get to them throughout the presentation. So um, with that, Jessica, yeah, welcome back. Great to see you, happy spring. And uh, give us some highlights of food access information that our audience might uh, if there's anyone in Charles County might be interested in. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Krissa. And thanks for having me back. Hopefully nobody's sick of seeing me yet. Uh, so I just have a few food access resources to highlight for you. One is um, one that's coming up this weekend. So that's April 17th. It's from 10 to 12 at Lifestyles in La Plata. I believe they're doing a produce distribution. And then our Charles County Judy Center, which is located at... Um, Dr. Mudd and Eva Turner schools, they are doing a uh, every other week produce distribution in uh, collaboration with the Southern Maryland Food Bank. So they'll be doing that at Dr. Mudd. I believe it's about uh, from 10 to 1, but they post that on their Facebook. And speaking of Facebook, as Krista mentioned, it's always great to check any uh, social media and the schools as well, because I know a lot of the um, schools and partnering organizations will post upcoming um, food uh, resource or food distributions that they may have. Great, thanks. Yeah, and we will also post information in the chat um, about statewide places that you can look, no matter where you are in the state of Maryland, for <clears throat> information about food pantries. So one is the Maryland Food Bank, which gives you a site finder for um, sites near you that participate with the Maryland Food Bank. There's another one, it's a texting application where you text the word food to 877-877 and it gives you both uh, school meal site locations as well as any food pantries. And I believe that um, that is inclusive of both ones that work with the Maryland Food Bank as well as other uh, food pantries as well. So no matter where you are, um, if you're struggling to put food on the table, access these resources, that's what they're there for. And then um, hopefully we'll have some ideas in this series of how to make the best use of that food and make sure you check out our YouTube channel. We'll, we'll post uh, that at the end uh, for back back issues of the series that have, um, everyone has a, a cooking demo that helps you eliminate waste, put healthy meals on, the, meals on the table, get your kids involved, all that great stuff that we uh, try to do here. So today we are gonna be talking about tomatoes. So uh, we're talking about growing tomatoes in this part of the series, our gardening <clears throat> the segment of the series. Um, as well as cooking with the featured vegetable. So I have to say tomatoes are probably the vegetable or fruit, if you want to get into that argument, that um, made me understand the difference between, you know, something you get from the grocery store and something that you get fresh from the garden 
fresh from the farmer's market. So of course, we're lucky to be able to get pretty much anything we want at most grocery stores any time of year. But um, when you can get them in season, um, you know, ripe, fresh picked from the vine, just, you know, such, such a different experience. So um, we're first going to go to a video that was filmed by a master gardener, Dara Bellows in Montgomery County, Maryland, who's going to <clears throat> walk us through growing tomatoes in a container. And tomatoes are one thing that you can plant one pot of and that seedling that you buy for $3, $2 using your SNAP benefits because you can buy food plants with SNAP benefits, you're gonna get a lot of tomatoes out of that. So this is a real bang for your buck. And she's gonna show us how you can, can plant those um, even using just recycled containers that you can get for free. So give us a second, we'll pull that up and she'll, she'll, it's about a seven minute video about the details of growing tomatoes in containers. Hi, I'm Dara, a Maryland master gardener. And today I'm going to talk to you about tomatoes. I have a tomato here um, that's ready to be repotted. So in a moment, I'll show you how to do that and some different options for containers that you can use. If you don't already have your tomato, there's a few ways you can get started. You can start seeds. It's actually not too late as I'm videoing it's mid April and you still have enough time to start seeds in your home. You could also buy a seedling from a nursery. Um, if you do and you know that you're growing in a container, you may want to look for something that says container varieties. That'll provide you with a plant that, that grows a, le a little smaller. It's a little less robust and will do really well in containers for you. So this tomato um, has really outgrown its pot. I have roots coming through the bottom. It's a bit top heavy because there's so much growth on it. Um, and it's ready to get into a larger container. So I have some different options here. One option is a food grade five gallon bucket. So this came from a restaurant um, and this held some food product that they received and they don't reuse these. So you can often ask at restaurants if they have any five gallon food grade buckets for you um, and they'll give these to you for free. One important consideration is that tomatoes and all plants need drainage. And so if I pot into this with a solid bottom, um, my plant isn't gonna do well. It's going to be really soggy in the root zone. So I would need to drill some holes. It's really easy to do this with a drill. You would start with at least, uh, you can use a quarter inch drill bit, or you can go up probably to about an inch drill bit. If you go any smaller than a quarter inch, then uh, the, the holes will clog with the roots. And then you can just drill four to six holes in the bottom of your, of your um, bucket. Another option are these grow bags. So these are made of a fabric so you don't have to put holes into them. This one's actually a 15 gallon grow bag. They also come in five and 10 gallon sizes. Um, you can get these for a couple dollars a piece online um, or at, at garden stores. I'm going to work with a plain old grower's pot. This is one that uh, came with a plant in it that I've already planted into my yard. Um, and you can also get these sometimes at nurseries or at big box stores. They may have ones that they've used and are willing to give you. So I'm going to um, first loosen up my plant so it's ready to pop out of a container. And then tomatoes are interesting. They really like to grow roots. So I can remove the foliage, these bottom leaves. I'm just gonna pinch them off. And now instead of planting my soil up to here, I can plant my soil up to here and the roots will come out of this stem all along. So that will give the plant a larger root system. Um, and the roots are how the plants take up water and nutrients, so it'll really help it establish well. So like I said, I want my soil level now to be about an inch below the top of the pot. Um, I've already pre-filled this with soil since it is such a large pot. The soil you use should not be from your yard or garden soil. It should be labeled potting soil. Um, so I've already filled this with, um, you can take a look, this soil. So it's labeled potting soil and it's a mix of some different um, peat and some compost and some perlite. The main reason you don't want to use yard soil or garden soil is because it's not well draining enough. So the roots don't get enough oxygen, they'll get very soggy and it'll lead to rot. Um, it also won't have nutrient in it. So that when you buy potting soil, it has fertilizer in it. So 
now that I've got my plant pretty much where I want it, I'm just going to hold it with one hand and sprinkle some soil on the top. We'll get it nice and level. So this plant has some flowers started since I'm just transplanting it. I wanted to focus on growing roots, not on growing fruit. So even though it feels painful, I'm gonna pinch these off. It's gonna grow a lot more flowers, so I'm not worried about it replacing those. So even though this plant is small right now, it's a cherry tomato and it's gonna get really big. So I do need to think about staking. So here are a couple options. One is this bamboo post. Um, this actually came from a neighbor's yard who has bamboo growing. I asked them and they said it was fine to go. I didn't cut some. And I can just stake this into the pot um, right next to the stem and tie the stem along as it grows. Another option is this tomato cage. And I know it does look really large now, but I promise this plant will grow. I'm gonna go ahead and set this in, even though I don't quite need it yet. And then as my plant grows, I might just need to kind of tuck it in to keep it growing straight up through the center of the cage. Tomatoes grow laterals, which means in between this leaf and this stem, it'll grow a whole nother shoot that looks like this. And as this plant grows, I'm going to pinch these off. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because otherwise the plant will be way too large for this container. Um, so just remember, you'll wanna do that. I can water this plant um, today now that I've just potted it up and then I'll be watering it every few days. As the plant gets larger, I will have to water this in summer, probably once a day. Um, something to keep in mind. You also will exhaust, you'll use up the fertilizer that came in the soil in a couple of weeks. So as this plant grows, tomatoes are very aggressive. They use a lot of food and they create lots of leaves and lots of fruit with that food. So you'll want to add some kind of food. You have a few different options. You can use something that's a time-release fruit fertilizer. They come as little round balls and you sprinkle it onto the soil or work it into the top. If you use that, you probably only have to do that once or twice for the whole life of this plant. It'll slowly break down. You could use a liquid fertilizer that you mix into your water. If I went that route, I would probably use it about once a week um, in order to keep this plant growing to uh, its full potential. Um, you can also use some different organic foods, things like worm castings or fish emulsion, and those you would also water in about once a week. Okay, so this plant um, is ready to go. You know, right now the temperatures are still down in the 40s at night, so I can't leave this outside. You don't wanna leave your tomatoes outside until your night temperatures are in the 60s. So I'm gonna bring this in and put it in an east or a south facing window where it still gets a lot of light. You can grow tomatoes inside if you have a really bright spot. They do better outside, but if you don't have that option, try them in a window, especially the cherry tomatoes. Um, you wanna give them full sun, which is six or more hours, so as much sunlight as you can give them. And then when the, when the plant starts to get flowers on it, if you have it inside, you're gonna have to act uh, as the wind and help with pollination. So these are self-pollinating and they're wind pollinated. And so what happens outside is the wind will come through and just rustle the plant a little bit and that will um, allow the, the flower to be pollinated and the fruit to set. When you have these inside, you need to be the wind. So come along and just give the branches a little shake and that'll help set fruit. If you have this outside, you don't need to do that. Only if you keep the plant inside. So typically we can put tomatoes out here around Mother's Day in mid-May, but you can watch the temperatures and once the nights are consistently in the 60s, it's safe to put them outside. So tomatoes take a little while to mature. My seedlings um, was about 30 days old, so it's already about a month. And depending on the type of tomato you're growing, it can be anywhere from 50 days to 80 days for them to mature from when the seed germinates. So I have about a month before I'm gonna see fruit on this. So from the time you transplant, you have a month to two months before you're gonna start seeing your fruit. So be patient. So that's it. I hope you uh, learned a lot about tomatoes and uh, I hope you enjoy planting. Happy tomato. All right, great. Well, uh, something I like to say about gardening is it takes a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. So, you know, she had a bucket with holes in it, soil and a tomato seedling that will absolutely get you started and hopefully get you at least a couple tomatoes. But then there's so many fine points that you can learn in year by year, get more and more successful. So uh, no time like the present. Well, 
couple weeks from now, we wanted to get this information out there a little bit early so you had time to prepare before that um, sort of uh, uh, planting date for tomatoes uh, once we're kind of past the cool weather and tomatoes can and other uh, summer plants like peppers and eggplant can be planted out. Um, so seek out your tomato plants, hardware stores, um, grocery stores sometimes have them, farmers markets, and again you can use your EBT uh, benefits, your SNAP benefits to buy those. Um, the other thing is that you can then use them in your cooking. So Jessica is back with us and she has um, put on a new chef's outfit to keep it lively here. <laughs> uh, so Jessica is going to talk about what you could do if you do have a bumper crop of tomatoes or maybe you just have some canned tomatoes in your in your uh, your pantry from the food pantry or from from your grocery shopping. So uh, tell us, you're gonna make us uh, some homemade marinara. Tell us what you got In going on there. Indeed, Krista, yeah, thank you. And I would like to say that I have also helped some uh, folks at one of the schools that I work with to plant our tomatoes in a, a five gallon bucket that we had. So it can be done uh, nearly anywhere. And I will say it was to much success. So when you have these abundance of tomatoes, as, uh, as we mentioned, we can make some lovely marinara sauce, which can go in so many different things. So I've uh, laid out on my cutting board here uh, some basic items that we can use for our marinara. As Krista mentioned, if you have some uh, canned tomatoes, so these could be something you have in your pantry or from the food pantry. I've got some whole peeled tomatoes here, and we're going to touch on the peeling uh, in a little bit as well or some crushed tomatoes. Now these are 28 ounce cans. They usually come in this size or about 14 and a half ounces. Uh, or if you have uh, an abundance of tomatoes, as we mentioned from your garden or elsewhere, maybe your neighbors are very friendly. We have uh, two different kinds here, Roma tomatoes. These are the kind that you're usually gonna find that are in cans and then just some on the vine here. But there's so many different kinds of tomatoes that you can use. Um, and then uh, for some extra flavor, we've got some onion and of course some garlic. I have fresh garlic here. You can also use powdered garlic. It's about a quarter teaspoon of uh, powdered garlic for one teaspoon of the fresh garlic. And then uh, to saute this all up, I've got some vegetable oil here. You could use olive oil, really whatever you've got. Um, and then for some additional flavor, we have, of course, some salt and pepper. And then here I've got uh, a mix of uh, oregano and Italian. You can really use what you've got on hand, basil, uh, you know, have some fun with it. Maybe you want to add um, some spice as well, make it a little spicy. It really depends on your preference, uh, but you can, you know, customize it as you wish. So we are going to um, switch over to focus more on our tomatoes. I'm going to start off with our canned tomatoes here. And while you transition, Jessica, I just wanted to mention to anybody who just joined us, um, if you haven't already introduced yourself with your county, if you're in Maryland, or your city and state, if you're from outside of Maryland. Um, and please, if you have any questions, particularly about, I love talking about growing. I uh, I am a gardener myself, so I love would love to answer any questions about growing tomatoes, um, and then we can definitely talk about questions about cooking with them as we go. So I'll toss it back to you, Jessica. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so I've got on my cutting board here again, we're going to focus more on those two cans that I had. So as I mentioned, these are 28 ounce cans. In the recipe that I did, I only used uh, one of these cans. However, if you are making marinara for you know months and months to come, perhaps you would like to use more. Uh, so you'll see our whole peeled tomatoes. As I mentioned, these are Roma tomatoes that have been um, cooked and peeled. And I'll show you those in just a moment. Or you can use crushed tomatoes. Now, when we're using the canned tomatoes, we want to crush these. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like in our bowl here. So this is a lovely job if you're looking to get a little bit messy or if you have some friends, some younger friends that really want, or any friends, any age, this is fun for any age, um, to want to use your hands. We want to turn these into crushed tomatoes. So for me, I'm just gonna use my hands. Of course, this is a great time to talk about hand washing as well. Um, always very important. 
So you'll see it gets fun, a little squishy. We get some, we can talk about the seeds there then as well. And our Roma tomatoes that are usually used in these cans are, um, have a thicker skin. They tend to, the um, manufacturers, I guess, of the, of the uh, canned tomatoes like that better because they peel a little bit easier when it's thicker. And then uh, they also are a bit more dense inside. So um, they have a bit more of the meat of the tomato, as we might say, and um, also a little bit less liquid. So we really like a, um, a thick sauce, or maybe you like it a little bit thinner, that's totally okay. Uh, but they do offer that for us. So this is a fun job, as I mentioned, for our friends to help with, or if anybody's really just trying to get their, their hands a little dirty. Now, with that, I'm going to, well, and I'm splat, you may be able to see this here too as well. You know, we get a, a few little splatters everywhere. So I think anytime you're cooking with tomatoes, right, whether it's on the stove or as you're squishing them, always to uh, be wary of the additional uh, splash zone for, uh, for it as well. So I'm going to set these to the side also, rid of the mess on my hands here and show you with our other tomatoes. So these were my tomatoes on the vine that I had and our Roma tomatoes. So now we're going to shift a bit to peeling. So as I mentioned, the, the cans were already peeled for our tomatoes that we may grow in our garden. Now these are gonna have, depending on your tomato, it's gonna be maybe a little bit thicker or a thinner skin. If you wanna leave the skin on, totally cool. Hey, this is your marinara sauce you know, do with it what you will. Some folks uh, may not like a little bit of the texture that comes with it, but there are additional nutrients in the skin as well. So um, a little bit of a trade-off too. You can also puree it, but let's focus back on that uh, peeling. There's a few different ways. Uh, one way that many of us may have heard about is a blanching method. So that's where you're going to use a knife to put an X in the bottom. You're actually going to make it not pretend do it as I am here. And then uh, stick that in a pot of boiling water for about 30 seconds, and then stick it in a bowl of cold or ice water. So yeah, basically just cold water. And that will help you um, to peel off the skin. Now that method can be nice if you have a ton of tomatoes, um, that is gonna take some time, right, to peel that. So that might be, uh, uh, you may prefer not to peel them then. And now we're also going to look at our Roma tomatoes. So these are the ones, as I mentioned, that are usually in the can. Again, these can be peeled in the same way or another method that I have found out about is freezing them. So with that, you're going to put them in a bag and stick them in the freezer. And then you get a lovely frosty tomato like this. Now, if you put that under running water, now obviously I don't have running water here, so we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that warm water will still help. We're going to submerge that in there and you can see it starts to get a little, um, a little wrinkly and then you can just peel off the skin. Now this may be a great job for little hands as well. I'm wondering if anybody- This, is, this was new to me. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm having some internet issues. So I'm hope, hopefully you can hear me. My, uh, this was a new method to me. I think it's very cool and requires way less materials than, you know, another pot and the hot water and the cold water. This is like way more accessible. I love that you're talking about the different varieties of tomatoes because that's something else that gardening opens you up to is that there's just so many different kinds and they're gonna vary in like, Je in, like Jessica said, in the, uh, the thickness of the skin, how sweet they are versus how sort of acidic tart they are, the colors, how seedy they are, how dense the flesh is. And so um, whether it's talking about sauce or just which ones you want to slice up and eat, um, there's just so many varieties to learn about. The other thing that um, I wanted to mention was if you shop at farmer's markets, um, especially as you get towards the end of the season, farmers may start having boxes of what they call seconds. So those are tomatoes that are a little bruised and damaged that people don't really want to pay first price for. Um, those are great. They can be really inexpensive and you can turn those, you can, you know, cut out the bad spots, peel them, uh, make them into sauce, put them in your, put the sauce in your freezer. And that's just a really um, <clears throat> way to kind of get some inexpensive tomatoes in your kitchen. 
For sure. And always great to uh, to support our local farmers market, right? So I, I wanted to show you um, quickly if we have the, the difference here between, I have, uh, I've got a plethora of tomatoes that I'm surrounded. So here's the difference of the, the meat on the inside, so our Roma tomato and our one on the vine. So if we are using our uh, one from the vine, as we mentioned, it may have a little bit more water in it and also these seeds. This is something, again, our friends can help with or maybe a little fun to just use your finger to scoop that out and you're left with um, basically the shell of the tomato there. So we are going to shift now. We've been talking and talking and talking about these tomatoes. Shift now to actually making our sauce. While you do that, I did have a question whether the freezing changed the texture of the tomatoes. Um, did that, is that something you noticed? So it does make them, I have some here that I have, um, I don't know if it's best to show you this way. I have some here that I had um, frozen and a little bit, it made it a little bit uh, softer because they are filled with a lot of water. Now I haven't cooked with these, I cooked with a can one. So that is kind of a question that I had as well um, is once it's cooked, uh, how that might change up the texture. So I'm interested if anyone else tries this out as well to so please, let us know. We're going to put it in our marinara sauce today. So I'll have to report back after I've gobbled down a bit, a bit more. Great. While Jessica gets ready to cook, I did want to mention we're going to post, we already posted a link to the Maryland Home and Garden Information Center's page on growing tomatoes, uh, which will give you a, everything you ever wanted to know and more about growing tomatoes. Um, there's also another link that we're going to post about um, pruning tomatoes. So um, Dara mentioned that in that video, um, pinching off laterals. Some people call those suckers. This is something if you're a newbie, you don't have to do it, but it can help you produce a stronger plant with better fruit. So there's a really nice video that shows you exactly what that means uh, from the Home and Garden Information Center and we'll post a link to that. Um, and then there's another one final resource that we'll post about choosing the right container. If you want to grow a vegetable in container, choosing the right container for what, what you want to grow. And um, with that, I think Jessica is ready to prepare our sauce. Indeed, switched up my headgear as well. I'm not sure if you can see that too, but anyways. <laughs> uh, so we are adding in our, um, we're going back to kind of our original uh, recipe here. We're starting with some oil. So I've got uh, about two tablespoons of oil in here. As I mentioned, it's vegetable oil. You can use olive oil, really whatever you've got. And uh, basic recipes that I've seen are going to have anywhere from like one to four tablespoons of oil. And that's really going to depend on um, how many onions you have as well. So I'm also going to add in, I have some chopped onions here. I've got maybe about a half a cup. So it's one small onion or um, half of an onion. This really depends on your as we've been mentioning, kind of your taste preferences. Uh, so I've got the burner on medium here and we're going to let these onions sizzle around for maybe three minutes or so. And I know Krista, when we were talking about this book um, yesterday, you know, this is a pretty basic marinara sauce with just tomatoes, onions, garlic. Um, but there are some other options that folks may want to add in if they want some additional flavors or just some extra fiber or nutrients. Uh, we had mentioned maybe carrots or uh, spinach later in the cooking process. I'm curious if you or anyone else have any other veggies that they have tried or might think of trying to throw into their uh, marinara. Yeah, I would, uh, I sometimes have seen recipes and have used um, celery that I would add at the same time as the, um, as the onion, you know, it cooks down. I, celery is a really interesting flavor. I like it a lot. Some people don't, but it certainly adds a different dimension to the sauce. Um, you mentioned spinach, but any type of green. Now, uh, I think we've mentioned the sort of um, tougher the, the green 
like something like kale is just going to take a little bit longer and you know you can cook it to your preference if you like it with a little more bite to it that's good or you can let it cook in the sauce um, until it's softer so anybody if you have other ideas oh we uh, bell peppers zucchini was suggested any other suggestions throw it in and, and so yeah this is just like your canvas that you can add what you'd like to to make it the meal that that you want to eat I love the zucchini idea right that's also a very uh, kind of Italian um, type of veggie to add to add in there and the uh, acid from the tomatoes would also be great with the kale that you mentioned kind of balance out that flavor. So I've also added in the garlic I have about three cloves of chopped garlic here. I'm gonna wait until that gets aromatic maybe uh, another 30 seconds or so. And I'm a person that likes to add in my spices with the uh, onions and garlic before I add in the liquid. So I'm gonna add in maybe about a half a teaspoon of my oregano here. And if you've got those fresh herbs, uh, you know, that you've been growing at home, you could also add those in, or if you've dried your own. And I'm also gonna add in a little bit of salt and pepper. And then next, I love that you mentioned oh. fresh herbs. If you're if you're new to gardening, herbs are a great place to start. They are so easy. Sometimes they grow in spite of your neglect. <laughs> so <laughs> something like oregano. I mean, honestly, they I would grow oregano in a pot because it, in the ground sometimes it can can take over. Similar to mint, basil is a wonderful one. And a lot of gardeners say basil and tomatoes grow really well together, and that they sort of complement each other. Um, so, so it's a great place to start, um, you know, and a single plant can just produce all season long. And basil can go in, I mean, that can go in almost anything. If you're doing some fancy drinks or, you know, other, um, other dishes, it's a wonderful addition. So I've added in our tomatoes as well. I added in the crushed tomatoes. I also have some of the, um, uh, fresh tomatoes that I had frozen and crushed. So we're going to add those in and test out that as well. And now comes the, um, well, maybe a little fun, maybe a little boring. We are going to let this come to a boil, kind of bring up the heat a bit. And then once it does that, we're going to reduce it down to a simmer. So really what we want to do is cook off some of that extra water, get a nice thick sauce. You can help smoosh down some of your uh, tomatoes here. And I would let it simmer. I've seen anywhere folks doing it from 15 minutes, if you want it a bit more loose, to up to 40 minutes uh, as well. And as it's, um, as it's simmering, you know, it's of course very important to have taste testers. So uh, that way you can adjust maybe uh, some of the herbs that you put in, maybe add a um, uh, salt and pepper or uh, towards the end, you also may want to add in if you have some of the, the more gentle greens like uh, our spinach that we mentioned, or even the crunchy kale too that Chris mentioned. Now, one of the great debates, one of the great debates in marinara is whether you add sugar. You do see some recipes that do include a little bit of sugar. So what is your thoughts on that? So I think it really depends on the tomato, especially if you've got some of those homegrown tomatoes or those, um, uh, the ones from the farmer's market, they probably have a great sweetness to them that they really don't need any additional sugar. But you know, a pinch uh, in your marinara sauce certainly uh, wouldn't hurt anything if you find that it needs a little bit of extra sweetness. I probably wouldn't go overboard and add in, you know, a quarter of a cup, but just a little bit at a time. And right, that's where the tasting comes in. So it's always nice to have your those that helped you crush the tomatoes can also help you taste test, you know, and adjust as well. And I think that's one of the reasons you might want to try making your own marinara for spaghetti or for pizza sauce. Um, you know, if there's a time and place for jarred sauce. If, you know, you need a quick meal, absolutely. Um, but sometimes they do have a surprising amount of sugar added to them. So that's one of the wonderful things about learning how to cook, teaching your kids how to cook is it really puts you in control of uh, what's in your, your food. So you don't have any of those sort of like, I didn't think I was eating, you know, nine grams of sugar in my, my spaghetti sauce because a lot of times um, those are things that are sort of hidden ingredients. 
This is very true, yes. So I am going to let this uh, simmer. And I know we don't want to sit here for 30 minutes and watch this, um, these tomatoes bubble. So I'm going to transition you over to uh, our lovely cooked version that we have. I want to show you what came out of the version that I made um, from our canned tomatoes. I'm just going to carefully shift over my burner here. So these are, let me see if I can get you a better, we have a, better image here. There we go. We have, a, we have a viewer that wants to let you know that her son loves your hat. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and, and that she likes to sneak in, in carrots, grates up some of those leftover school carrots and adds them to sauce. That's a great idea. And the carrots may also add that sweetness too, instead of the, um, instead of adding any sugar because carrots are also naturally very sweet and you may even have those growing in your garden as well so hey they can pair up so here is our um some of the sauce you see it's thickened up quite a bit that was with the crushed tomatoes from the can and now we while i've heard you know some of us do just like to eat some scoops of this marinara sauce it's even more fun if you try it out in different ways so some other fun ways that you could use it. One way would be, and uh, yeah, also- Yeah, while you get ready to show us that. Go ahead. Oh, so uh, we're actually gonna, before you do that, we're gonna pull up our slide of our next couple of sessions and then we'll let you close it out with some, um, some final showcase. All right, so we have um, two final sessions in our gardening series. Uh, next week we're going to talk about celery and really we're talking about celery um, in terms of being able to regrow it from the scraps that you would throw away but we'll also talk about some other veggies you can do that with as well um, but we'll make a nice dip that can accompany um, celery carrots and, and radishes things that you can can regrow from the the scraps of food that you buy uh, then we're gonna have a really exciting one on uh, april 29th we're gonna visit a school garden at a snap ed site it's really inspiring um, and talk about, about what we do with school gardens um, and their place in education. Um, and then we're going to make school garden salsa. Um, like our Facebook page, if you're watching this live, you've already found your way here. Um, if you are seeing this recorded, you can see it here on our Facebook page. Um, but on our next slide, we'll also show you where else you can find us. We've got a new website for, it's still, we call it our Eat Smart page. It's our recipe database, um, extension.umd.edu slash Eat Smart. That's where you'll find the recipes that we prepare here. Um, Facebook is Eat Smart MD. Um, like us, follow us, turn on notifications. And then our YouTube channel is where we keep um, an archive of all of the Making the Most series videos. We also have lots of lessons, nutrition lessons, other recipes that there's there's a video preparation instructions for so lots of great content for um, family nutrition there so let's check back in with jessica and see what she's what she would do with that delicious marinara well i've got my lunch already planned i don't know about everybody else so what i have here is a spaghetti squash now it looks a little and a visitor fruit fly uh it looks a little funky because i have already cooked it actually and i believe we're going to put um some instructions on cooking this in the microwave if you'd like you can also cook it in the oven or do a mix of both so this one's great because your bowl comes already there i've added in a little bit of marinara into it and you could add um maybe a favorite protein, some beans, some extra veggies, and then you can eat it straight out of your um, natural bowl that it came in. Or if you're looking for more of a pizza style, we've also got our uh, Make It Myself pizza. I added on some veggies that I had there from a soup I was making. It's some of our marinara sauce, a bit of cheese, and then um, you know any veggies that may interest you or you've got uh, extra in the, in the fridge. And of course, you can always have some fun with it as well and make some lovely shapes and faces with it. Yeah, so if you haven't had spaghetti squash before, it is really, it's just really cool how when you get your fork in there, those, that um, the flesh really kind of turns into these strings that are like spaghetti, but they've got a little bit of crispness to it. And uh, I love serving it right there in the shell. That's beautiful. Um, and we'll also post a link 
um, to the make it myself pizza in the chat. Um, that's just something that we do. You can use English muffin, slice of toast, but marinara cheese, and then top it with whatever you want. This is a, a great uh, snack that kids can prepare for themselves or lunch. So wonderful. Well, we hope to see you back here next week at 11 o'clock to talk about regrowing food from kitchen scraps. And, um, and then the following week as well, we'll be announcing continuation of our series soon. And thanks for everybody who participated. And you can post uh, comments and questions in, in, the, in the chat even after the video is over if you have any questions. So thanks for your participation and we will see you back here next week.